Okay, so the talk today is supposed to be uh, very simple and we hope uh, that we can do this. All right. So uh, what we will do today, uh, we will talk about uh, the Yomdin Gromov lemma, the famous lemma, I will explain to it and uh, uh, we talk somehow about uh, the situation when the Yomdin Gromov lemma is not correct and then we offer ways to, uh, to, to fix these issues. And after this, we are going to talk about uh, O-minimal theory, which is basically uh, a candidate for tame geometry, and uh, illustrate uh, using a famous result called Pila Wilkie how um, these kinds of questions about uh, tame geometry can really, really impact uh, arithmetic and their fine tame geometry. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, begin with a nice uh, Grotter Dick quote. So after some, it's, uh, it's not my translation. It's some translation. After some 10 years, I would now say with hindsight that general topology was developed by analysts and in order to meet the needs of analysis, not for topology per se. So Grotendieck, uh, of course, pointed out that uh, there are a lot of pathological and topological spaces like uh, space filling curves and uh, so on and so on. And there are a lot of uh, such examples. Okay, so uh, he, he says that what really interests him in topology are basically a few things. He uh, outlined uh, what a theory of tame geometry should uh, kind of uh, uh, satisfy. And the most important things is that the tame sets or tame geometric uh, objects uh, should be uh, triangulate. You can triangulate them, it's important, so we can do homology on them. And also uh, it's very important to have uh, stratification. So uh, O-minimality is, is a candidate theory uh, for the tame topology, which uh, Grotendieck sort of asked for. And uh, you can stratify uh, sets uh, what, that are O-minimal, and uh, we will talk about these definitions and so on. Uh, what is also much, much uh, more recent, it seems that the O-minimal uh, structures contain a lot of very, very important uh, and complicated spaces, like moduli spaces of algebraic curves and abelian varieties, and even more general uh, pod structures, but we will not talk about this. And uh, it turned out kind of unexpectedly by uh, mostly Pila, Wilkie, Pila and Wilkie and uh, some other mathematicians that the methods of tame geometry and uh, it's very, very useful for arithmetic geometry, uh, which is quite surprising. Okay, so my research team is interested in, in arithmetic geometry much more than in tame geometry, but uh, to paraphrase, uh, O minimality was developed by real geometers and in order to meet the needs of real geometry, not for arithmetic geometry per se. So part of uh, what our research team did, okay, so I didn't do it, but uh, my advisors invented an instance of tame geometry for, uh, for the holomorphic category, okay? I will be very vague. And uh, what I did is uh, refined their construction uh, so that it will better suit uh, arithmetic geometry, and soon we will see um, uh, an example of this. Okay. okay, so any questions? Good. Uh, this talk will be divided into three parts. The first part, I will talk about the yomdin gromov lemma, holomorphic parametrization, and uh, our uh, result about it, one of our results. Uh, the second section, I will explain, uh, this will be the the part where I define most of the things. So I'm going to be defining heights, if you don't know her, because they're the basic object of arithmetic geometry. Um, and we'll also really give the definition of what an O minimal structure means. And after this, we will give an example of a very nice theorem, the Pili Wilkie theorem. And hopefully, if we have time, we will show how it can be used to prove the Manning Mumford conjecture. And it is very interesting because this proof is completely different to anything that came before. There are a lot of proofs for this conjecture, but uh, for this theorem, let's say, but uh, this proof with tame geometry is very, very different. Okay, good. So let's begin with the definition. So we have, uh, wait a second. Yes. Okay, so we have a domain U in Rn, okay? And we have a CR smooth function. Okay, so it's not even a function, it's a map. It has N coordinates functions. So we just denote uh, the norm of F to be the maximum or supremum norm on U, depends the maximum exists. And for R, we define the Rth norm as basically the maximum norm of the 
all of the partial derivatives of order R, but we also normalize them with a factorial. Okay, so it's not, doesn't really matter, but uh, that's the way we, we think about this. Okay, so, but in the case where we have a holomorphic map, okay, so H is a holomorphic map this time. So very often in the uh, holomorphic category, you don't really need to bound all of the derivatives of your uh, holomorphic function. What, if you know that your holomorphic function is uh, defined on a large enough domain, and also you know that there is a good uh, bound on its normal, uh, ordinary norm, then all of these uh, Cauchy type theorems will automatically give you bounds on the derivatives. So in the holomorphic world, we much rather say that a map is bounded by some number, uh, its norm is bounded in some number, and it is defined over a large domain, rather than saying that uh, all of the derivatives are as, have small norm. All right, so a subset of RL is called the semi-algebraic. If it is a finite union of sets of the form, okay, so it's uh, basically a system of equations and inequalities uh, that have, uh, where the inequalities and equations are polynomial. So semi-algebraic sets is the simplest O-minimal structure that exists, okay? And of course, uh, very interesting for real algebraic geometry to study semi-algebraic sets, obviously. Okay, so let's uh, state the yomdin gromov of lemma. Now, uh, uh, basically, Yomdin proved some lemma when he was uh, working on uh, some entropy conjectures and uh, some work in dynamics. Uh, but uh, Gromov really refined his work and somehow gave a lecture where he explained that uh, you can get more. And it took some time for people to, to understand what Gromov said and basically to provide the full mathematical proof. And today this lemma is called the uh, yomdin gromov lemma. So let X uh, be a semi-algebraic set of dimension mu, which is contained in a box, okay? And let beta be the sum of all degrees of equations or inequalities defining X. So beta, of course, uh, I mean, you can look at X, it can maybe be the solution of different uh, systems of equations. But what I mean here is that uh, in one of these presentations, beta is the sum of all degrees, you know? Okay, and uh, so beta is some, somehow the complexity of X, and uh, we fix- But this is unique, or you take the minimum again? Uh, no, so I don't. Beta. Basically, I take the minimum, but uh, what I write here, I just mean that X can be presented as a union of systems of equations where the sum of all degrees is beta, but okay. Yeah. But uh, it, I mean, it's dangerous to take the minimum because most of the paper I actually have more than one parameter, and then kind of uh, it's uh, it's difficult. You take the minimum over beta, but maybe the smallest beta comes with not the smallest other parameter for complexity. So very often I will just say that x has complexity beta if it can be presented with a system of equations of complexity beta. Okay. Uh, all right. So. Then what we want to do to X is cover it by images of cubes. Okay, so it's a very typical question. In geometry, you have some manifold or set, and you want to cover it with the simple sets. Okay, so fix some uh, natural R, then there exists a constant, which depends only on the parameters, not on X, on the dimension, on R, on the complexity, and on L, okay, the dimension of the uh, space where X is inside. Okay, and the uh, CR smooth functions, uh, phi1 up, up to phi c from the unit cube of the correct dimension into x, so that uh, x will be covered by them, and also they are controlled, so their uh, norm is small. Okay, so what I will uh, say about this theorem, it's very, first of all, it's a very typical question of, let's say, table geometry, how complicated uh, can x be? Uh, but also what is remarkable is that this constant depends only on the parameters and not on the geometry of it. And in fact, it was proved uh, in 2019 by uh, my advisors, uh, Dimitri Novikov and Gal Benjamini, that uh, C can be taken to be polynomial in beta times R to the power mu. So anyone has questions about the formulation of this theorem? Very good. So what I do want to know, you to notice is that if we if we kind of, you know, a semi-algebraic set is an analytic object naturally. So you may ask, why do we want to cover it by CR smooth functions? And notice that this asymptotic, if R goes to infinity, it also goes to infinity. So it kind of tells us that uh, if we want this CI to be uh, analytic, then this lemma will not be uh, correct, at least here. 
So let's say C. So when R goes to infinity, C goes to infinity. And now that if we have a C infinity... I, I, can I ask a question? Yes. So, uh, following your remark, so when you write C equal poly L beta, this is a lower bound or...? Uh, this is an upper bound. Uh, this means that C... Bound. So, yes. so in principle, this is what they put in, in, uh, in 2019 doesn't imply that it goes without infinity, the worst case. Uh, because it's just an upper bound. But you say that we expect that it will go to infinity. Yes, yes, we expect. I mean, per x, to, hmm? you know, per x, it will not go to infinity because x is, um, it can be compact and then you can always cover it. Uh, yeah, 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 I'm saying the worst case when we take the, the worst x. Yes, yes, the worst it's case. In each R. Yes. Uh, it, so you know to show that it goes to infinity? It, 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 it doesn't have to happen. I mean, there are some, it depends very much on the actually hyperbolic uh, geometry of X. And uh, there are some X where there is no, no problem passing R to infinity and getting a uh, holomorphic parameterization. But if you take the worst case. Then yes, the in the worst case scenario, it will uh, yes, go to infinity. Thank you. Okay, uh, good. And also what I want you to notice that, okay, if we have a smooth, uh, C infinity smooth function, Satisfying that uh, this norm, and I will remind you that this means the norm of the rth derivative divided by r factorial. So if these are smaller than one, then it's a very basic uh, complex analysis exercise that f will extend to a fixed complex neighborhood of 0, 1 power n. You just uh, write out Taylor series and you use regular formulas for the remainder, and these things will tell you that the remainder goes to 0. And uh, so you will have locally analytic function. So kind of the holomorphic case is that the PCI from before, what we require them is that they extend into the unit, into the poly disk of radius two in CL. And what I want it, I want its uh, norm. What, what happened? So, is, it, is it Windows? Sorry. Yeah, everything you, you can see now the, uh, everything is okay now. Uh, so in the holomorphic case, what we require instead of bounds on the norm, we just require so that the functions will extend to a large enough domain and have norm uh, smaller than two there. Okay. So now let's look at the bad uh, example. So let's look at the family x epsilon equals x y. It's the family of hyperbolas x y equals epsilon. And the uh, didn't prove, and it's actually not hard to prove that if you want to cover x epsilon with maps satisfying this then you will need O of log log epsilon maps. This is a lower bound. You need at least uh, this many maps. And, what the, and in addition, actually, if we require the valency of these maps to be uniformly bounded, then one needs even more uh, maps, O of log epsilon. Now, the valency of a map is uh, just the size, maximal size of the fiber. So what I want you to think about this is, how I want you to th think about this is that if you want to cover X epsilon, you can do it with O of log log epsilon maps. Uh, but if you want these maps to be one-to-one, -one, which is a reasonable assumption, right? We parameterize x, uh, then you need actually even more. And this means that uh, the Jomdin chromo fails because for different epsilons, all of these uh, hyperbolas have the same parameters, beta, mu, l, uh, and so on, right? And what we see that, uh, in fact, the number of maps needed does not depend, it's not, it depends on the geometry of x. Okay. And I will state now. Sorry, can, you, can you explain again why do we want to cover domains with such maps? What, what's the. Why do I want to cover? Okay, so uh, it's very uh, basically what's the motivation? So, first of all, kind of uh, uniformization, you know, to cover a manifold with, uh, with the model sets where just open balls or cubes or something like this, it's, uh, uh, it's a good question. Just uh, think about it like this. You want to do analysis on a semi-algebraic set or something like this. So it's much easier to do analysis on just the unit cube. And uh, if you can cover uh, X with maps from the unit cube and you control their derivatives, then you can just pull back everything and use the you know ordinary rich function theory that exists for cubes and, and so on. So it's uh, in that sense, it's always interesting to parameterize the set. Um, yeah, but but the Yomting Grom of Lemma was developed for uh, entropy conjectures, so they kind of needed the the counting thing and so on. I will later also show another in very important use of the Yomting Grom of Lemma. 
Okay. Yeah, thanks. Good. Okay, so we see that this uh, uh, does not hold if, if in the holomorphic parametrization. And in fact, we proved using our uh, time geometry, complex time geometry methods, we proved that this is the worst that can happen in general. I mean that in general, the number of maps that you need can grow at most like logarithm of the distance to some set. Here, uh, the set would be the point zero zero, right? O of log epsilon would be log of the distance between epsilon and zero. So we proved that at, at worst, this is the worst that can happen. But now imagine, okay, that I tell you that epsilon is a fraction. Imagine that epsilon is just m over n, a reduced fraction, and just say that uh, m and n, you can bound them, right? You can bound uh, their size by some number h. So if we know this, you can say that, okay, the smallest epsilon can be is one over h, okay? And in this case, we will need uh, O of uh, basically, okay, in the, I will uh, usually be referring to uh, this case where the maps are one-to-one, -one, we will need O of uh, log epsilon maps, which is kind of O of uh, log H. And uh, I will denote log H by just a smaller H. So you expect that if the family is definable over Q and you can, over the rational numbers, and epsilon is rational with a bound on its, uh, uh, on its, uh, nominator and denominator, then you can give an absolute bound on the number of maps needed. And so this is uh, basically the content of the following theorem. So if x were defined with equations and inequalities over q bar with logarithmic height h, so logarithmic height is this h, I will soon explain what is height, uh, then we need at most poly L beta times h to the power mu. So in this case, uh, this before it was r to the power mu, now it's h to the power mu, and in our case, mu is one, so it's just all of log epsilon or just h. And moreover, this psi can be taken to be algebraic functions uh, over q bar with complexity polynomial in the complexity of x and height poly beta times h. And I will explain uh, what is an algebraic function, what is complexity, what is height, I will explain all this. But somehow you can see that uh, our methods are just, we can, it's not as if this theorem could not be uh, somehow proved differently, but our methods are very useful for, very natural to use for a tame geometry. Really? This is a theorem of Gromov, right? No, this theorem in green is my, th my theorem. Ah, so, okay, because you yeah. forgot to write your name. Okay, ah, okay. so green uh, things are reserved to Grothendieck quotes and uh, our theorems. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about heights, but before this, I must erase. Blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay, so, uh, by the way, anyone has any questions on uh, the previous theorem, the previous uh, frame? No. Okay, so if we have a reduced fraction, we define its height to be the maximum among the nominator and denominator in absolute value. And we define the logarithmic height to be just the log logarithm of the height. It's uh, more natural to, to use h of it. Uh, immediately, you should notice that if you bound h and you ask how many rational numbers there are, with height smaller than h, so the answer is a finite number, which is obvious. And in fact, asymptotically, it will be uh, h squared, uh, but at least a finite number. Okay, so why is this height good? So the question of arithmetic geometry is you have some algebraic variety, uh, definable over q or over some number field, and you ask the structure of its rational points or, uh, or points uh, over q bar. And you know, kind of what, what is this question? What kind of answer do you expect? You can say, okay, maybe it's finite, maybe it's infinite, uh, but really a much more meaningful answer would be to count the number of rational points on a variety of height at most h. And then you look at this and you take h, h goes to infinity and you look at this asymptotically. So heights can be used to somehow like a density on the rationals, okay? so if you if a set contains many rational points, we can say that up to height h, it contains most of the, I don't know, fractions of height smaller than h. But what I want to convince you is actually that height is much more intelligent than this, uh, you know? So it has a very intelligent definition. So let's, let's, let's go with the, with the next definition. So uh, let, uh, 
this uh, absolute value with subscript p is uh, the p-adic value for p finite or just the normal absolute value on q when p is e equal to infinity. So they are the normalized absolute values on q bar. So uh, if anyone wants me to remind him what uh, or her what uh, the p-adic norm is, now is the time to do so. Okay, so I will assume everyone. Oh, normalized mean that the, the value of, uh, of p is uh, one over p? Yes, well, basically when I say normalized, I, uh, what I mean is that there is a product that uh, the, the, the product of the norms of some number with, with respect to all p equals to one. And yes, uh, more specifically, <laughs> it's going to be one over p for p, yes. So for each p is one over p and for infinity is the usual absolute. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So what we do, uh, what, we're, what we want to do is we look at the number x and we want to ask what are its big valuations, okay? And so the height of x is going to be the product uh, uh, among all of the p's of the maximum between one and between the valuation. So you should think about this, that if it has some valuation which is small, then the height doesn't see this. And if you have some valuation which is big, then the height does see this. Okay, so let's uh, just make sure that uh, these definitions are the same. So if, and excuse me, Yes. So if uh, the fraction is smaller than one, then okay, uh, the infinity norm doesn't matter because uh, it's going to be smaller than one. And also, uh, if you take the nominator, right, uh, all of its finite norms, periodic norms, they will not matter because it's an integer, and so its periodic norms are smaller than one. So it doesn't matter. So somehow, if if m is smaller than n, then m doesn't even affect the height. And you just get uh, the product of uh, the p-adic norms of, uh, of 1 over n, which equals to n. And otherwise, if the fraction is bigger than 1, so it's almost like before, only this time, there is the infinity norm does matter. And it does uh, add a term to this product. So you just get what we got before, which is n times the infinity norm, which is n. So anyone has questions about this uh, calculation? Good. So in general, uh, there is actually a very nice uh, kind of field, field theory about this. You have finite field extension. Uh, you have some absolute values uh, on the base. You want to ask which values extend them, how many are they, and so, so how many are there, and so on. And it's a very interesting theory. But uh, luckily, if I want to define heights uh, on algebraic uh, on uh, number fields, I can uh, kind of circumvent all of that. So let k be a number field and let x be in k. So what we are looking at, we are looking at all the different embeddings uh, of k into the algebraic closure of a periodic field. Okay, and so what I claim is basically that in the separable case, uh, if you ask what are all the different uh, norms on k with correct multiplicities, I will tell you that just look at all the different embeddings and it will give you the correct uh, multiplicities and the norms as well. Okay, so this is cheating, okay? So usually, because heights, they are not only exclusive to number fields, they are actually much more general. Usually you would have to work a little bit more and uh, kind of present a full set of absolute values whose product is one, like here, but in the separable case, you can just get them by embedding. Uh, okay, anyone has questions? Okay, so it doesn't really matter. I just uh, say this out of fullness. Uh, for the rest of the lecture, you can think of height and heights of rational numbers. Okay, so what about uh, points with more than one coordinate? So the point is that um, if you have, you know, an array of numbers, a, a vector, and you want to define its height, you don't define its height to be the maximum among the heights of the coordinates. For example, what you do is per valuation, you look at which coordinate is biggest with respect to this valuation. So if x uh, is a point in a uh, projective space over k, we define its height to be, again, product over all of these uh, embeddings. It's just taking all the different norms on k. This is how you should think about this, of the maximum among the coordinates of the norm. OK, and uh, what I want you to notice is two things. First of all, uh, you, of course, uh, should ask yourself, uh, is it well defined? You know, if we take all the coordinates and uh, multiply them by a number, uh, will we get the same height? And the answer is yes, because if we multiply all the coordinates by some number x, uh, what will go outside of this uh, formula is this expression, just the product of all the different okay. norms of x. Yes. 
I, I'm just confused by the notation. I'm not sure if it's just a typo or that there is something that I don't understand. Yes. So when you write CKL, you mean the projective space? Oh, of course. So yes. It's just yes. a typo, yes. right? Yes. It's yes. not yes. I missed something. Okay. No, no, of course. Of course, I mean uh, projective space. Of yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, so it is well defined. And also, if you want to have heights on affine spaces, just take one of the coordinates to equal one. And as you saw before, uh, in the previous slide, the height for just the one dimensional fine space would be the maximum between nar one and the norm of the coordinate. So it makes sense. Um, again, we have North Cots property. So again, if we fix H and D and we ask how many points are there whose uh, degree is at most D and height is at most H, it's finite again. And also, uh, basically, if we have height for vectors or for points in the projective space, we automatically have the notion of height for polynomials. Just take uh, the vector of coefficient and take its height. And uh, what is unclear is uh, you need, if you do this, it would be desirable to relate the height of the product of polynomials and the height of, the, of, of and the sum of their heights, basically. I say sum because I use logarithmic height. So this is a lemma by Nesterenko. So let the P1 up to PS be uh, polynomials and the P will be their product. So up to a negative constant of times the degree, uh, the height of A of P and the sums of heights uh, is the same thing. Okay. This, this uses the Mahler measure or just? Yes, actually, yes. Okay, thank you, sorry. Okay, so now if, if uh, you remember, this is uh, going to be our almost last slide about heights. If you remember, I told in the yongdin gromov lemma that in the rational case, I can use algebraic function. So what is an algebraic function? So I give here a very simple definition. It's not the definition I like, but uh, it's a sim simple definition. So we have a holomorphic function. Uh, it's algebraic if it uh, satisfies some polynomial equation where the kind of uh, coefficients are polynomial in the variables, polynomials in X. If, in, in, if this equation is definable over Q bar, we say that F is algebraic over Q bar. And in both these cases, there exists uh, such a polynomial which is irreducible. Okay, so this is an exercise for you, a very good exercise. If someone doesn't see this, uh, if it satisfies a polynomial, it also satisfies an irreducible polynomial over Q bar. And uh, we define the complexity of F to be the degree of P and the height of F to be the height of P. And also, if you have a map instead of a function, you can define the complexity to be the maximum among the complexities of the coordinates and the same with height. And uh, we studied these uh, functions a little bit in our uh, research and we came up with the following theorem, which sounds easy. It just says that uh, basically the uh, composition of two algebraic functions are, is again algebraic uh, over Q with these kind of uh, bounds on the complexity of the composition and the height of the composition. So number one and number two are not so hard to get, but what is hard to prove is just that the composition of two algebraic functions is even algebraic, so it's hard to prove. And uh, if you wish, uh, you can think about it and talk uh, with me about it uh, because it's very interesting. Okay, so now uh, we know almost everything we need to know about heights and uh, algebraic functions. And before I finish the part of this talk, which is about heights, I want to talk to you about uh, where you can go from here because my research is more about uh, an analytic geometry and it, it of course uh, touches height, but we are in an algebra seminar. So this is a wonderful uh, opportunity to explain uh, some little things about height. So first of all, there is a whale height machine. So it's a homomorphism between the whale class groups to the set of functions from the rational points of x to r, modular bounded functions. So I will not explain what whale class group here and so on, but what I want to say is that this uh, block is very down to earth. What I say here is very simple. If you have a projective variety and you embed it into projective space, automatically you get a notion of height for its rational points because we have a notion of height in projective space. If you take an embedding of a projective variety and then change the coordinates in the ambient space, it turns out that the new height function is, is the same as the old height function up to a bounded function, up to a negative bounded function. Moreover, if you have two embeddings and you get from them two height functions, which are uh, the same up to a bounded function, then these two embeddings are, uh, are the same up to a change of coordinates, okay? And uh, basically, because every well divisor is uh, the difference between a base point free divisor and a very ample divisor, we can, uh, use, we can 
extend this construction to the entire whale class group. So this is a very, very useful homomorphism. And uh, one of the very, very first applications of this whale height machine is to prove the Mordell whale theorem. So the Mordell whale theorem says that if A is an abelian variety over K, then uh, it's, uh, if you look at it as, an, as a commutative group, at its K points, it's finitely generated. So I remind everyone that an abelian variety is a projective uh, subvariety, which is also, okay, not subvariety, sorry, projective uh, variety, which is also a, an abelian group. So this is one way to go uh, if you want to go uh, deeper into the theory of heights. Another way to go is into arithmetic intersection theory. So uh, let, let X be a projective subvariety, uh, which is definable over Q bar. And uh, in 1986, Philippon defined uh, the height of X to be the height of the Chao form. Now, what is Chao form? It does, it's not important. There is a one-to-one -one way to associate a polynomial to a projective subvariety of PL. And uh, Philippon says we define the height of the subvariety to be the height of this polynomial. Very naive definition. I would love to tell you why uh, he needed this, but unfortunately the paper is in French, so I don't know. Okay. So later, uh, Gillet and Seol uh, developed, and uh, basically they were inspired by Raquel, they developed the arithmetic uh, intersection theory. Uh, which is very, very, very good. It's very good to have intersection theory, but unfortunately, it's also in French. Okay, so uh, I can't uh, say a lot about this. No, it's recorded, right? What? You know it is recorded. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but, and then uh, in 1991, Foltings, uh, uh, wait, I knew why he wanted to do this. Just a kind of forgot. Ah, yes. Foltings wanted to prove the Manning Mumford conjecture, and he needed to define height of subvarieties. And what he did is he used uh, the arithmetic intersection theory by Gilles and Seol. So, similarly, how the degree of a projective subvariety, you can do it by uh, taking the class of the subvariety in some Chow group, intersect it with the correct amount of hyperplanes, and you count the points. And this is a kind of a degree. This is how modern intersection theory looks. And uh, there is also a notion of intersection theory, uh, arithmetic intersection theory in arithmetic Chow groups and arithmetic hyperplane class, arithmetic fundamental class, arithmetic degree, so on. All right, and, but so to compile even the right-hand side is very difficult, but uh, what you should immediately notice that it's very similar to just ordinary uh, intersection theory. And uh, in 1994, Boss Gillen Seol uh, wrote a big paper uh, about heights. Just a second, Benny, just to follow the history. So Falting has developed this intersection theory in order to prove the, the what is known today as Falting's theorem that he got the Pilz medal on. That uh, uh, I, um, what is with, with genus uh, at least two as only finally many rational. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I think so. I'm not sure he used it uh, to prove this, but well, initially he used the Rakelov theory and then in later proves this more modern machinery was used. Thank you. Okay. Good. And uh, what they also gave us is an arithmetic Bezout theorem, which I actually used in this in my work, uh, that the intersection of uh, the height of an intersection is smaller than kind of uh, this thing, okay? So it's just for you because you're interested in algebra. It's very good to point out uh, where we can go from here as far as heights are concerned. Wonderful. Let's talk about uh, O minimal structures. We finally have the time. And uh, okay, so what is an O minimal structure? An O minimal structure is a collection of Boolean algebras, uh, SK, excuse me, XK in PRK. So for each K, you have some subsets of RK, which form Boolean algebras. And let's talk about what other axioms we want. So the first axiom is that if A is definable, okay, I say that. Uh, it's a terminology that if a set belongs to a no minimal structure, you just call it definable. So if A is definable, then R times A and A times R are also definable in S uh, L plus one. Uh, for each L and for each IJ, the diagonals are definable. And also if you have the standard projection and, and you take a definable set, then its projection will also be definable. So these first three or maybe four axioms uh, they they say the following thing. So if you have a subset over k, you can just think of it as a formula with k uh, free variables. And it's going to get uh, the the value truth if the point is in the set, and the value false if the point is not in the set. 
So what these axioms say is that if you begin with, if you have a collection of formulas which correspond to definable sets, and you do all kinds of first order, order logic operations on them, you know, and uh, uh, you quantify it, whatever, then you will end up with a definable set. Okay, so these are what these three, um, uh, basically, four first axioms are about. And uh, for quantification, we also need the, the projection. Okay. Next two axioms is about uh, inter interaction with the field structure and the order structure on R. So we just want literally the set, the relation x smaller than y to be a definable set. And also the graphs of the multiplication and addition are definable sets. OK, so this is, these axioms are just about interaction with the field. And the last axiom, it's about tameness. It's about geometry. And it says that uh, a subset of R is definable if and only if it is a finite union of points and intervals. So this is where the tameness comes from. So if we project, 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 project down onto a line, uh, in the end, we will get with something very tame, finite union of intervals. Anyone has questions about the definition? Good. So let's talk about some examples. So semi-linear sets are just like uh, semi-algebraic sets, only uh, instead of polynomial equations and inequalities, we take linear in uh, equations and inequalities. So it's almost a non-minimal structure. It doesn't contain the graph of multipli multiplication, but we also don't really want it to. So I mean, spiritually, it's a non-minimal structure, let's say. Like this. So semi-algebraic sets is the simplest O-minimal structure. Every O-minimal structure is going to contain the semi-algebraic sets. And they were studied by uh, Tarski and Zeidenberg. OK. Now, before we move on to the next uh, uh, O-minimal structure, I claim that so the graph So semi-algebraic sets are of the O-minimal structure that is, that is generated by semi-linear sets? Oh, yes, you can say it like this. But just in general, if you want the smallest uh, O-minimal structure you want, it's going to be the semi-algebraic sets because of these axioms. Yeah, OK, I can see that. Okay. Yes. OK, and so there is no O-minimal structure which contains the graph of uh, sinus x. This is because if you intersect the graph of sinus x with the x-axis, you get the infinite discrete set of points. And on the one hand, and on the other hand, if sinus x is definable, then this intersection is definable. So it will be a contradiction. So no minimal structure ever contains the graph of sinus x. But what we could do is take the graph of sinus x over a compact domain, and then this issue can't occur. So RAN is obtained by joining graphs of restricted analytic functions. So restricted, I mean uh, restricted to a compact domain, uh, to the semi-algebraic uh, structure. So this is RAN. And also, then again, uh, we can take RAN and add it to it one analytic function, which is the exponent. Is with, I mean, the exponent is very good, and it doesn't uh, ruin tameness. OK, so these are the examples. Very good. Now. Uh, Pila Wilkie, uh, in order to use their uh, kind of the Yomdin Gromov ideas into, to uh, use them to arithmetic geometry, they needed uh, an O minimal version of Yomdin Gromov and the family version. So I will just very briefly read this so you can see how it looks like in the O minimal setting. Uh, let X epsilon be a family of definable sets. So it doesn't matter which O minimal structure we take. And uh, each fiber is of dimension smaller than mu. Okay, so dimension can drop down uh, over fibers, it happens. So there exists a constant, which this time depends on the geometry of x, okay? But it does not depend on epsilon and so on. So that's what's good. Such that for any epsilon, there are C definable maps uh, so that their image cover x. And uh, again, they are very, very, uh, they are controlled. So this is the O minimal version. And they, it is heavily used to prove the following remarkable theorem. So let A in our L be definable. OK, so uh, this theorem says that if we count the number of points in A, which is of height at most h, we get growth, which is sub-polynomial in h. But there is, of course, a few things to say about this. So firstly, uh, if you have a set which is algebraic, you actually do expect it to contain a lot of rational points. So we need to take only the transcendental part. So if we have a set we denote by the algebraic part, part A alg to be the union of all semi-algebraic curves contained in A, basically the union of all connected semi-algebraic subsets. 
uh, of positive dimension. And the, trans oops. and the transcendental part is just obtained by taking A and dropping the algebraic part. And so, and for any set X, we can define X of dH. It's the, now, it's the set of points of X, uh, which are of degree at most D and of height at most H. So now we can read this theorem. So let A be definable and fix any epsilon in D. So the, the number, the amount of points of height at most H in A, in the transcendental part of A, is subpolynomial in H. Okay, so anyone has questions about this formulation? Okay, very good. So basically what this means that sets which are um, not pathological, okay, from the point- Example in, in R1, for example? An example. Uh, I'm confused with the algebraic and transcendental part. Okay, so basically in R1, okay, first of all, a definable subset is going to be a finite union of uh, semi of, of of points and intervals, and then the algebraic per, uh, part will be just all of the all of these intervals. So the transcendental part is going to be finite number of points. Okay, let's say it like this. It's not really interested. Uh, let's let's just say that uh, that L is bigger than two. Okay. Okay, so, I, uh, so what is the simplest example? Which is not, not trivial. So you can take, a, so for example, you can take something like the graph of, uh, of sinus six, I guess, right? Uh, over the, the domain zero one. Yes. So see sinus kind of uh, over some compact domain, whatever. So you can just ask how many points on this curve uh, there are of height at most h and you're going to get a subpolynomial answer. So it's not easy to see, I mean. Uh, maybe you can uh, explain what, what, uh, what you're trying to ask, what you're asking. I think I, I got lost somewhere because I thought that height was defined on Q bar, no? Yes, yes, yes. So what do you mean by points on the graph in Q bar? Right? Yes, yes. So X of dH is, uh, as you can see here, it's point on X uh, whose degree over Q is at most oh, D. Okay. So in particular, the, yeah, they're in Q bar. I think this is what confuses me because for me, uh, transcendence is something that is not in Q bar. It's not the same notion. So yeah, sure. So what, what confused me? Okay, thanks. Okay, good. Well, yeah, we are we count the rational points or the algebraic points on A. Okay, so very good. So we see that the things that are not pathological uh, from the definable point of view, so definable subsets, or also behave like we expect from the arithmetic point of view. So we indeed expect that the transcendental set will contain a small number of uh, rational points. All right, and. Uh, Hopefully, we will right now be able to use this very nice Pilo Wilkie theorem uh, to prove the Manning uh, Mumford conjecture. So, what is this conjecture? We will prove this form. So, let A be an abelian variety and let X be a subvariety which doesn't contain a translate of an abelian subvariety of A of positive dimension. So, we have an abelian, abelian subvariety. Uh, abelian. Is a billion? What? What is an abelian variety? A is a billion. What is a billion? What is a billion? A billion variety is a, a projective variety, which is also in a billion group, similarly to uh, uh, groups. To community. The easiest example is the uh, elliptic curve. Yes, yes. So the classical example is uh, the elliptic curve, which is a projective variety. And uh, as you know, it has a group structure. OK, so this is uh, if, if you should you should think about really elliptic curves. Of, for this theorem. You, you don't really need to think about anything else. So uh, A is an abelian variety and X is a subvariety, which is not a subgroup. And in fact, it doesn't contain a coset of a subgroup of positive dimensions. So X is kind of far away from all of the subgroups. So the theorem says that in this case, X can contain at only finitely many torsion points. Okay. So anyone has questions about this theorem? Okay, so this proof is due to Pila and Zanier. And as I said before, Faltings proved this with his notion of height, but this proof is completely different. So first of all, uh, it's a fact that every abelian variety is a torus. It's not a hard fact. It just, uh, it's not a hard fact. And uh, what we do, we write A to, uh, to be like uh, the, uh, 
quotient of CL times some lattice, okay? And the let pi be the projection. Uh, we also assume without loss of generality that this lattice is just the integer lattice. Now, be careful, I'm not saying this because it, it, doesn't, mat it doesn't change the structure of A. The structure of A really does matter, it really does depend on, on the lattice, uh, but the pillow wilkie theorem is, uh, it doesn't really care about if you count rational points or if you count por torsion points uh, with respect to some lattice, it doesn't really care. So this is why, uh, let's imagine that this lattice is just ordinary z to the power 2L. Then we notice that x in A is a torsion point if and only if uh, there is an element in the fiber which is a rational vector, all of its coordinates are rational numbers, and all of the denominators are dividing h. So if you multiply this rational vector by h, suddenly all of the coordinates are integer. Integers, and in this quotient, you will get just a zero element. Okay, so please stop me if uh, at any point uh, I say something which is uh, unclear. Okay, so let's look at the pre image of x. Okay, so we have a, a comes. Uh, we have a map from CL to A, and let's look at the pre-image of X itself. Um, the Y tag is invariant with respect to the lattice, so this is obvious, and it doesn't contain translations of any linear subspace. This follows uh, from our condition about X, and this means, and it's not easy to prove, that the algebraic part of the Y tag is zero. There is no algebraic part, and I want to just say that very often when you use pillow wiki, the hardest part is to prove that the set you want to use pillow wiki on is really transcendental. So this is hard, or at least the hardest part of this proof. Okay, but say we know this, and uh, also because we, we have uh, y tag is invariant to the lattice, we don't really need to consider all of it, and we can just uh, consider about just all of the points inside of the fundamental domain. Okay, so what will Pili Wilki tell us? Pili Wilki tells us that Y contains at most this many points, right, uh, of height uh, at most h. And in particular, because of item one, what we conclude is that for any exponent h and, and uh, any epsilon, there are at most uh, O x of h to the power epsilon torsion points with exponent h. So we can bound the amount of torsion points with exponent h. Okay. On the other hand, uh, if we have a torsion point of exponent h, okay, uh, then it's not it's not so hard to prove uh, that the amount of Galois conjugates p has over k uh, um, is at least some is at least h to the power rho for some positive rho. And notice that uh, okay, I didn't write here in the theorem, but I do mean that a and x are definable over k. And if this is so, then all of the Galois conjugates of P are going to be elements of X, torsion points of A with exponent H. Okay, so basically, what can we conclude from points three and four? What we conclude that uh, the, the maximal possible exponent for torsion points is bounded because, um, uh, because if H can be unbounded, then we have at least uh, this much uh, um, you know, uh, uh, torsion points of exponent h, but on the other hand, we can use here epsilon equals rho over two, and we will see that we have at most this this many exponents, this many torsion points, and if h can grow to infinity, then we get a contradiction. So combining three and four, we conclude uh, that uh, the exponent um, h must be bounded, and then, for example, from one, uh, you immediately conclude that uh, x can contain only infinitely many uh, torsion points of h. Okay, so uh, this is everything I wanted uh, to show today. So thank you very much. Uh, just a small, just a small uh, correction. But just yeah. the result that you attribute to Master is actually first due to David. Uh, yeah, Master just proved that uh, P will have a large degree over Q, I think. And then, uh, or, or that is also what belongs to David. I think David first proved it and, and he proved some sharp form and Master um, maybe independently, but slightly later proved slightly less sharp thing, which is enough for for number four. But I mean, I don't know. People usually refer to it as the result of David. OK, so uh, very good. David, yeah, sorry. Thank you. OK, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hey, David is David. Which David? You know David. Who? 
Sino David. He's a French. Wait, thank you so much. Um, are there any... Let me stop the recording.